All right, here we go. Later in the show, we will be joined by one of the world's leading environmental activists, former U.S. Vice President Al Gore. But right now, I'm joined here in Studio Q by another voice for change, Canada's leading environmental champion, award-winning scientist and broadcaster Dr. David Suzuki. Recently, David Suzuki traveled to Stockholm, Sweden, to receive the Right Livelihood Award, also known as the Alternative Nobel Prize. It's an international award that, quote, honors and supports those offering practical and exemplary answers to the most urgent challenges facing us today. This will be proof that David Suzuki's environmental efforts have had an impact not only on Canadians, but people all over the world. It's the latest honor in a distinguished career that's been defined by David Suzuki's interest in how we relate to the natural world around us. He recently celebrated his 30th anniversary of hosting Canada's longest-running TV documentary series, The Nature of Things. He's also a prolific author and the founder of the David Suzuki Foundation, an influential and occasionally controversial nonprofit organization dedicated to conservation issues. I'm pleased to have David Suzuki with me now, live in Studio Q. Hello, sir. Hello. Wow, that was a long intro. Thank you. <laughs> too very long, much. right? Yes, They're very, getting to, much too long. Much, much too, too long. well. Well, it, but I, you see, we have to say these things about someone <laughs> who's done as much as you have. I can't just rush into this. Right? Well, you know, I like to tell the story that there are dozens and dozens of people that work at the Nature of Things that work in my foundation, and they work their tails off, and I get all the credit for the work they do. <laughs> you know, one of the great lessons I learned was from Jim Murray, my the old friend and and executive producer of The Nature of Things. We were filming in New Orleans, and this is, oh, 30, more than 30 years ago. I was still a hotshot scientist. You know, I was very impatient with this process, and the cameraman kept coming up and taking a light reading in front of my face. And finally I said, Rudy, for God's sake, shoot the damn thing. Mm -hmm. And Jim grabbed my arm and pulled me into the room. He said, listen, there's a sound man there, there's a lighting man there, the camera assistant, the cameraman. They're all working their butts off to make you look good, and that's not easy. And I kind of <laughs> slunk back in, realizing, you right, know, it's true. Right, Nobody right. says, hey, that show, listen to the sound on that. It was great. They all say it's, it's true. Suzuki, it's true. Know? And it's definitely true of this show, too. There's an incredible team behind it. Having said that, you're the one receiving this award. And let me just, uh, to quote the Right Livelihood Award, this prize uh, this prize has been gi- given to you for, and I'm quoting, lifetime advocacy of the socially responsible use of science and for your massive contribution to raising awareness about the perils of climate change and building public support policies to address it. On a personal level, David, what does an honor like this mean to you? Well, I, the, the honor, as I say, is it, it's given, I'm accepting it on behalf, really, of of my foundation, on behalf of the nature of things people, but Also, Canadians kept the nature of things on air for 50 years next year, and that's what uh, that I have to be grateful for. The nature of things gave me an opportunity to not only be educated, but to take a message out there. So I I really, it's not for me, it's it's really for a lot more than that. We should remind people that the nature of things existed before you. Exactly. You you haven't been doing it for 50 years. It was a half-hour program without a host, and then I came on anyway. But you have been doing it for for 30 years. David, you've been vocal about many of the issues taken up by the environmental movement. Take us back. Can you remember the first idea or issue or moment that really galvanized you as an environmental yeah, activist. Absolutely. I owe everything to a woman. Seems to be in my whole life that's the case. But uh, Rachel Carson, 1962, published a book called Silent Spring. It was all about the unexpected effect of pesticides. Now, you got to remember that up until that time, everybody thought technology is wonderful, things are getting better and better. It was a shock to realize oh my God, this great achievement, chemical pesticides, has a downside we didn't even know about. No, you know, By the 1960s, uh, breast milk in women in North America was considered too toxic to feed to babies. Mm. Why? Because we discovered this thing called biomagnification. You spray at low concentrations in the environment, and it gets concentrated up the food chain, so that by the time you get the shell glands of birds or breasts of women, you've... you've magnified it enormously. We didn't know about that. Mm. And in 1962, when her book came out, there wasn't a single department or minister of the environment in any government on the planet. I mean, the word environment then just didn't mean what we know we take it to be today. Right, right. She really put it on the map. And the environmental movement exploded after her book came out. 
And then, so you're an activist, a scientist, and an educator at the time. You earned a PhD in zoology and taught at UBC before uh, beginning your first forays into media. What made you want to step away from the microscope, at least part of the time, and enter the world of broadcasting? Well, I, it was a fluke, actually. Uh, remember, when I went away to college, I went to, uh, to the United States in 1954. There wasn't a broadcast, a television station in London, Ontario, where I lived. We used to catch signals from Cleveland or Detroit in these great big antennae, and all you'd see on the screen was just like <laughs> snow. You couldn't <laughs> see anything. So I never watched TV when I went away to college. Uh, when I, once I was in school, I was too busy, and then grad school. First television set I ever owned was in 1962 when I was a professor at the University of Alberta. And suddenly I realized, holy cow, you know, people watch this all the time. And the university had a program called Your University Speaks, a very serious program. Mm -hmm. And they asked me if I would give, do one of the programs. I did one. And they loved it, and I ended up doing eight. So that, to me, in 1962, was the beginning of that television career. And how much of that television career, or that foray into media, because you did radio, too, of course. Yeah. You're the host of Quirk, uh, Quirks and Quarks. How much of that was about a platform for environmental issues and, and your activism? Not at all when I started in, in the beginning. At that time, I had just come back from living in the United States for eight years. Come back to the university, apply for a grant, they say... We're, give, we're giving you a bigger grant than most people get at your stage, 4200 bucks. This is at a time when my gr fellow grad students in the States were getting sixty to $80,000 grants. NRC in Canada gave me 4200 And uh, I started looking for jobs back in the States. And to my amazement, what happened is the Americans gave me a big grant that I could keep in Canada. Mm -hmm. So I stayed in Canada because I got an American grant. But the, the, the point is, I was stunned at how scientifically illiterate Canadians were. They had no idea what was going on in genetics and in many other areas. Right. And I felt that I, I from purely selfish, selfish reasons, I said, Canadians better know how important science is so that I'll get a bigger grant. <laughs> and so my early forays into television were really to try to educate Canadians about why science was important. But thanks to Rachel Carson, there was a, a second side to the impact of science and technology that you had to deal with. Which raises an interesting, uh, I don't want to say paradox, but tension for, for David Suzuki over the years, I would imagine. Because uh, first a scientist, I think impartial and that's almost how you would need to govern yourself as mm. a as a scientist uh and i think as a broadcaster you're at least supposed to live by the postulate of mm. objectivity you know uh and yet you're also an activist so how do how do you bring I, those I've worlds together i've never separated them I, I don't first of all the idea of objectivity is the dumbest idea i've ever heard there is no such thing unless you're a corpse I mean, the minute you're born into the world, if you're a male or a female, you're going to see the world in a radically different way. Mm -hmm. If you're born a Christian or an atheist, if you're, you know, if you're born in a, a middle-class family or, or a poor family, all kinds of things shape the way that we see the world. And why do we care that there's Canadian news? If we're so objective, why do we care whether there's Canadian or American news? Why do we want more gender parity in, in terms of our hosts if it's all objective? Because the way we grow up shapes the way we see the world. And, and it's absurd to say that we're, we're objective. I think the important thing is that we have a balance of different worldviews or, or different uh, values mm -hmm. and beliefs, and that we're open about what our, our values and beliefs are. Well, some people would say we have to try. We have to try. To be objective. Yeah. <laughs> Even if it doesn't exist, the unattainable goal, yes. right? Yes. Okay. okay. <laughs> I mean, uh, you know, some people would. Yes. Yeah. You've always been outspoken as a broadcaster, at least in in the more recent decades. Sometimes I might say, in an alarming way for your audience, I want to play an old television clip for, of you from 1972, uh -oh. in which you argue that humans aren't really. Uh, you'll like this, I think. Uh, that aren't really all that different from fruit fruit flies, or oh, yeah. more specifically from their offspring, maggots. This is David Suzuki in 1972. You're born as an egg, and you live in that egg environment, and your parents kind of cut out all the external crap that comes in and protect you and nourish you and clothe you and all that. It's a very nice little egg, and it's comfortable. But at some point, you hatch out. You start crawling around and eating stuff on your own. You start reading, you start looking at the tube, you start doing all sorts of things. You hatch out as a maggot. 
<laughs> and a maggot, a maggot can now crawl around. It's got two dimensions, and it can ingest food at its will, and it defecates all over the environment. And some other smaller maggots can even eat your defecation and get some nourishment out of it. There you go. That's David Suzuki from 1972 uh, comparing humans and, and, and maggots. Well, but the point is that if you get the right case, you pupate and emerge as a butterfly. <laughs> ah, we, we cut that part off. <laughs> yes. I was going to say that's not the, most, it's not the most optimistic view of our species. How have your thoughts about humanity changed since then? Well, humanity is humanity. You know, I, I hang out a lot with First Nations people who have taught me a lot. But I keep wanting to shake them and say, stop being so human. You know, you're just as screwed up as we are. And uh, we're just people, you know, and the idea that we're somehow advancing, uh, well, we advance in certain areas, I guess. My parents' generation, it was inconceivable for a Japanese to, to go out with a white person and get married. Mm. My children, on the other hand, they're all married to non-Asian non, non uh, Asian people, and they, they don't think anything of it. There's been a lot of change, but I don't doubt that if uh, condition, I mean, just look at what we're responding to in terms of the Muslim community, well, we haven't advanced very much when you scratch the surface. So it's a constant struggle. And I think what defines us as something worthwhile is that we try. We just keep trying, working, and trying to make a better place. Let me stick with broadcasting for a second. You're, you're currently celebrating this 30th year as the host of Nature of Things. There are many more science and animal programs on TV mm -hmm. these days, as you know, but they often seem to have a mandate to entertain. Are you okay with the direction of the popular science uh, and the way it, it has gone, or do you think it slid too far into the realm of cute little meerkats and crazy inventions? Well, I worry about that a lot, and science itself is often depicted as, wow, what will they think of next, you know? And we become magicians that... Whoa, look at what the, we can do now. And so much of it is based on early studies and, and potential. They, they don't really come to fruition. And I, think, I don't think that we dig deep enough. What Rachel Carson did for me was to say, you scientists, as I read her book, it was a very personal read to me, you scientists, you're very clever. You can make a thing like DDT, show it kills insects, but you forget that the lab is not the real world. In the lab, you grow stuff in a chamber, growth chamber or a Florence flask, mm. In the real world, things interact. The wind blows, the sun shines, it snows. All kinds of things happen. And what you think you're, you're replicating the world in the lab, you're not. It's an artifact. So be very, very careful when you try to extrapolate from what you're doing in the lab to the real world. That was her message to me. It's not that science is terrible or that it's dangerous. It is if it's applied the wrong way. It's just that we have to be very careful in the way we extrapolate from what we do now to the real world out there. And, and given what you, the, the eloquent uh, uh, defense of lack of objectivity that you made uh, earlier, do you, do, would you like to see more environmental awareness or urgency being expressed in nature shows? I'm thinking of Discovery Channel Fair. Yes, well... I, you know, I talked to David Attenborough about this. David Attenborough and, and the BBC do the greatest natural history films in the world. I mean, they set the standard. And yet, you know, when you look at these magnificent series that he's done, Life on Earth and, and the, uh, the Blue Planet, and he's just done one magnificent series after another. And yet, you know damn well, many of the incredible animals he's showing are probably extinct or near extinct by the time the shows run mm. and yet there you don't see any sense in the programs he does where he comes on and says look i'm david attenborough i've seen this the wonders of nature and we're trashing it no it's just oh isn't nature wonderful and he's always said well i think you have to make people fall in love with nature and then they'll they'll protect it it's but that's too slow and I think that he is sooner or later they have to come out and start saying, yes, these shots may be the last we'll ever get of these species because they're going extinct. Uh, he claims that the minute they start doing an environmental program that audience, uh, audiences drop. Well, that may very well be, but tough. You We've got to get once the message there's, out once there. Once there seems to be a, a more of an educational component in terms of uh, 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 activism? I guess in Britain, uh, environmentalists... Are, are kind of marginalized. I, I did a series for BBC called uh, Cracking the Code about the, the new molecular genetics, and they used to call me Mr. Green as a joke among the staff. And these are people that produced the show Horizon, which mm. is an eminent mm. uh, science show there, but they thought I was this funny character. This is back over 10 years ago, but they thought I was this funny character because <laughs> they just didn't take the environment 
uh, that seriously. We're going to be joined at any moment now by by Al Gore, and I want to segue into what uh, the meat of what we're going to be talking about. In fact, the, the door is uh, mm-hmm. just opening now. Uh, obviously, these days, one of the most pressing environmental issues is climate change. It's an incredibly complex, and at times it can be a divisive issue, and one that you've been talking about uh, for more than 20 years, well before the idea uh, became uh, popularized. At what point did you decide... David Suzuki, that global warming itself was a real, a, a very real and potent threat. Well, I'd heard of global warming, of course, in the uh, uh, early 1970s, and but never really took it very seriously because to me there were major issues of deforestation, species extinction, ocean pollution, and I was much more focused on that. And it was only in 1988 a number of things happened. I was invited to Australia for the first time by the Commission for the Future. This is a non-government organization set up by the government to uh, look at the future for of Australia. Very good, uh, good idea. And the scientists in uh, Melbourne at the Commission for the Future, took me through the data, and I went, oh, my God, this is serious. We can't fool around. So that's when I, I, I did my first thinking about this is a serious issue. Al Gore came to Halifax that fall. I'm sure Mr. Gore doesn't remember this. And I was getting ready to do a series called It's a Matter of Survival. And I interviewed Al at that time. Now, Mr. Gore had already been to Antarctica, Right. And he had had congressional hearings on climate change. This is no Johnny-come-lately guy. And talking to him, having heard the scientists in uh, Australia, that's when I said, we've got to do something. We did a two-hour special on global warming the next year. And even then, in the script, I remember it said, we must act on, on this now. But it's a slow motion catastrophe. We really believed in 1988 that, that we had decades to go. All right, let's hold it right there. We need to pause for a commercial break, but please do stay tuned for more in discussion with Al Gore and David Suzuki here in Studio Q. When we return, we'll get their thoughts on the climate change conference in Copenhagen, Denmark. And I also want to get them to respond to some of the listener questions that have been sent to us over the past few weeks. Stick around. <laughs> 